Let's see. Is that mic on? I don't know. Now it's on. Well, uh, get your Bibles turned to Psalm 48. Psalm 48. And let's stand and sing that together, the first two verses this morning, to start off. Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2, we'll be singing from the King James. Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great King. Again, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king amen our father we thank you for this day our great king we worship you lord jesus we bow to you today and thank you for your faithfulness and love thank you for all that you do for us and how you've blessed us i pray you would give us ears to hear what the spirit says to us today instruct us in the ways of righteousness Use Brother Billy in anointing from on high as he comes to teach this morning. And may you bless him, fill him with the Holy Spirit, and use him and just glorify yourself in him. And if you'd be pleased to use me this day, Father, I'll be forever grateful. May you have all the glory and everything in Christ's precious name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Um, I don't really have many announcements. Um, I think our folks that have had the COVID are, uh, the ones I know of are recovered and uh, doing all right. Uh, remember David traveling today, he's showing, uh, as a showing for his film and also he'll be speaking at the Christian Film Conference and we mentioned Natasha, and I think Thomas traveled up this weekend to watch competition. But anyway, those that are traveling, anybody got unspoken requests? You got burdens you're praying about? Amen. I think we all do. Remember to keep one another in prayer during these times. All right. You ready to lean into the Word, Brother Billy? Come bring the Word to us. chapter 1. When I originally started looking at this, I was uh, focusing on verse 5, and, and really 5 through the end of the chapter, and uh, the more I got into it, uh, we won't even make the first five today, we'll, we'll okay. read the first four verses, and uh, Hopefully God can, can help us with these four verses. <clears throat> There's a whole lot here. First uh, John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, we have seen it, and bear witness, 
and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. <clears throat> This first epistle of John starts off a lot like the gospel that John wrote. Uh, you know, if you look at both of them, there's a whole lot of similarities there. Uh, he talks about the Word. Uh, that Word was from the beginning. It was manifested, or made flesh. <clears throat> John said this Word was made flesh. He says we've seen it. We've heard it. We've touched it. Uh, John has had some time to think about and reflect when he wrote both the, his gospel and this. It's been several years after Jesus had been crucified and resurrected. And he had some time to sit back and think about all the stuff that he had, he had been a part of. And it almost seemed like he was overwhelmed with the fact that he was in the presence of God, that he saw him. Uh, he was right there with him. He heard him. He even touched. He was a, even able to reach out and touch the Son of God. And that, that seemed to have a, a big effect on him, which you can imagine it would. Y'all know we won't turn there, but y'all know what it says in St. John chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, he says, and the, he, you know, it starts out, the Word was made flesh and all those things. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. But in verse 14 he says, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He, was, he just seemed to be overwhelmed with the fact that he was right there with God. <clears throat> um, look at verse 2. Look how John describes Jesus in verse 2. He said, this life was manifested. For the life, he's talking about Jesus, for the life was manifested. And then he goes on and says, that eternal life showing to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. <clears throat> when you look at how John starts his gospel in this, this letter too, uh, you get the sense that he's trying to make some points, get some things across to his readers, that, some, some, some things that they'll understand so he can go, go from there. And what he's wanting us to know is Jesus is eternal. He didn't, he didn't have a beginning. Uh, he was not part of creation. Yes. Jesus wasn't created. He wasn't made. He made everything. He wasn't, uh, he was the spring. He wasn't part of the river. Uh, uh, and then he was manifested. Uh, he was made flesh. John says he, uh, he lived in a particular time in a particular place. And one more thing John wants to make sure we understand is he, he said, I saw it. I was there. Not only did I see him and hear him, but he said, I even touched him. Uh, why do you think John is so fixed on this one point? Why is he trying to make this point clear in both of his letters right off the bat? I think he's saying that, that at this time that Jesus is God's finest and clearest presentation of who himself really is. Yeah. But the fact that Jesus was a, uh, was born God's son was born at a specific time in history, lived on earth as a man, all these things. That's a stumbling block for a lot of people. Isn't it? Way back in John's time, uh, you can turn back here if you want to, but look at 2 John verse 7. John's, John's telling his readers here, it says, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. John had people back in his day that had a hard time believing this. They didn't, they didn't want to accept the fact. They, uh, for a bunch of different reasons, but they didn't, want to, they didn't want to come to the realization that Jesus was God. He was, he was actually born in a specific time and he lived on this earth. Um, but go a little further. Why does that make so much difference? Why, if 
Jesus was born on earth and, and all that? Why does it make so much of a difference? Why does it seem so important to John to get it across to us that that happened? Um, we, we won't take time to discuss it. I, I wish we had time. We could probably get stuck right there for a while. But turn back again to 1 John chapter 4. And this, this will tell us. We'll look at verses 2 and 3. First John chapter 4, verse 2. It says, Hereby I know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is, is it in the world. So the reason this is so important, this, this determines what team you're on. This determines what side you're on. If you say that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, then the Bible says that you're from the other devil. If you do believe that Jesus was the Son of God and came in the flesh, then that, that's a spirit that comes from God. That's something that God would reveal to you. <clears throat> uh, there's also a very important byproduct of this, what side you, you believe, which way you believe about this. Uh, in, in verse 3 talks about it, and I'm trying to run through this because really trying to get to, to verse 4 but um, but anyway verse 3 tells us another important byproduct of what you believe about this about where what you think about Jesus <clears throat> look at verse 3 it says that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you John said all this stuff that Jesus talked about all the, all the things that we know about him that we've seen about him we're declaring this unto you and he said we're doing that for a reason and he says that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> you cannot have fellowship with God, His Son, or His people until you confess that Jesus is who He said He was. You're not, there's no way to do that. There's no way to have fellowship with God apart from believing Jesus uh, is the Son of God and came in the flesh and did all the things that He said He did. Uh, why is this a stumbling block for people? Why, is, why do people have a hard time coming to that realization? I don't think that most people would have a problem as long as Jesus is a spirit in heaven somewhere floating around, kind of watching over them, taking care of them, things like that. That doesn't really bother a lot of people. And then even if you just say that Jesus was a good man, he did come to earth, uh, he lived a good life, he said a lot of good things, did some good things, even did some miracles maybe. He was probably a prophet or something, a good man, you know, that God used. But he was just a man. He died a long time ago. I even think I'm not, I don't know a whole lot about this kind of stuff. I think there's even other religions that believe basically that. Uh, but they, people wouldn't really have a problem with that. that. That doesn't really bother too many people. You're not going to cause a lot of hard feelings that way. But why... Why was Jesus being the Son of God and coming to earth at a specific time, in a specific place, dying on a specific cross? Why does that bother so many people? Why do people have such a hard time dealing with that? Why do you think? For some different reasons, back in those days, I mean, at that uh, certain time, for the Pharisees, for example, Jesus coming back would kind of like demote them from their high standing in society. I mean, they would no longer have that place there. For us now, I think, I mean, for some people, it's just because they're still in the darkness, I believe. I mean, I... Well, it, it, if, if they, I think what it is, if they, if they accept that, if they say that and they believe that, then there's some things that go along with that. If they say they believe this Jewish man that was born thousands of years ago really was God, what he said really what was true really counted that means they had to they have to do what he said he's the one in control he's he's the one that that's making the rules they're 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 no longer in control of their their self they're uh you know there really is a god that we're accountable to that our eternity is dependent upon and lost world that's just intolerable to a lost world they can't 
the devil won't let people accept that. Uh, we talked earlier about how the devils at work everywhere and, and everything, and uh, but that's just intolerable to people in a lost state to say that there's a God that I'm going to answer to and I have to bow down to him. I, their pride won't let them do it. <clears throat> but John makes it clear, in not just in these verses, we just read the first few verses, but if you read his books and read all the things he, he's written, he makes it clear that this doctrine is, is not negotiable. It's not debate right. There's no, you know, there's no gray area there. Uh, Amen. We can have no fellowship with you. We, we as Christians can not have, not have true fellowship with, with someone that doesn't agree on this point, that doesn't agree that Jesus is who he said he is. Isn't it sad today that how not just individual Christians and churches, but even whole denominations have kind of watered down their doctrines so that they'll kind of fit in more with people? Um, it offends people to say that the only way you're going to have fellowship, the only way we can have fellowship with you is that if you believe Jesus is who he said he is. If you don't, then we can't have any true Christian fellowship with you. Things like that bother people. Things like that hurt people's feelings. But John didn't didn't sway on that. He, he didn't he didn't give him right. on that. He said he said we can. That's the only way we can have fellowship with you. There's a loving sense. This whole book, all of John, y'all know, is probably the most intimate book besides maybe Song of Solomon in the whole Bible. Uh, John's love for people and, and God's people comes out in everything he does. So he's not being mean about this. He wants them to be part of this fellowship. He, you know, that's what his desire is. But there's only one way they can do that. And he starts off his book right here with it. Uh, there's kind of a side note, maybe, uh, and this is just something that come across studying this and thought about it a little bit, but uh, really doesn't have anything to do with what I'm talking about this morning. But but you can see by this, by these verses, studying these verses, one reason that the Bible says that you should only marry, if you're a Christian, you should only marry another Christian. Christians shouldn't marry non-Christians. It's it's almost impossible for you to have a true but it is impossible for you to have a true bond with your spouse if you disagree about this one point how can you you can't have a fellowship with another Christian how can you have a fellowship with your spouse and have any kind of relationship like God intended to if you don't agree on this one point and like I said that's not really part of what I want to talk about but it, it just kind of come up and, and uh, so I thought I'd throw it in there um, Look again at verse 3 before we move to verse 4. Kind of paraphrase this. Um, John says, uh, we've seen some things, we've, I've witnessed some things, uh, been a part of some things. He said, I'm, I'm going to talk, I'm going to declare to you, I'm going to tell them to you. And it, that says that, and you could put a so in there, so that you also may have fellowship with us. I'm telling you about these things because I want you to have fellowship with us. And then he says, really, that fellowship that we would have as Christians, really, that's a fellowship that's with the, the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. That's that's what makes this fellowship special. Uh, that's what makes it unique. Uh, and then look at verse 4. <clears throat> verse 4 says, And these things write me unto you, that your joy may be full. Most translations, I don't know if y'all have something other than King James that may say, it may end that verse, says that your joy may be full. It may say that our joy <coughs> may be complete or something like that. And uh, I, I don't know which one's most accurate, but, but I know it's true either way. If, if, um, if you do have this fellowship with God and His Son and, and with other Christians, um, you're going to be happy. You're going to have joy. That's going to bring you joy. But when someone comes into that fellowship, it gives us joy too, doesn't it? Um, if you're a true Christian and you see someone that isn't in that fellowship, but they're brought into that fellowship, uh, I don't know if you'd say that completes your joy or fulfills your joy, but it, it does bring you joy too. So whether you whether it translated our joy or your joy, I think they're both right. 
but it does it does bring joy to the person that comes in that fellowship and it brings joy to other Christians that are already in that fellowship to see that person come. <coughs> um, we know that the Bible makes it clear, you know it, and the Bible makes it clear that you can't have any real fellowship with someone that's outside of this fellowship we're talking about. And I heard a preacher, I think it was a preacher, I can't even remember for sure now, a few days ago, he was talking about someone that he met. And this person was very successful. I can't remember exactly why, but they, they were wealthy, had money, uh, had all the things you would think a person would want. But he said this person was miserable. Uh, they weren't happy at all. They were even worse than that. They were miserable. Uh, and he went on to make the point that after he talked to this guy and then a little more, and then he said it's true with really with pretty much the world in general. Uh, the reason there's so many rich, famous, wealthy, successful people that are not happy, that are, are miserable, he says because all, most of them all their life they think that if they get this or if they get that, if they get to this point, then they're going to be happy. Uh, they're not happy where they're at, but they think if I can just acquire this or if I can just get to this level, then that's going to make the difference. I'm going to be happy then. And when they get to that point, they're still not happy. So they get, try to get more. And really when they get to the top is when they're the most miserable. When they get everything that they can think that they would want, there's really nothing else for them to go after to get, and they're still miserable. That's when they're the most miserable. Uh, in our verses talk about that. You say, I could ask you why is that the case? Why is it the case that people are most miserable when they get the most things that they think they want uh, that they think it would make them happy? Uh, it's because of the verses we just read about. Uh, mankind can only have true joy if they have a fellowship with God, a true fellowship with God. <clears throat> why is that true? Life. Yeah, and he was alive. That's true. Well, everything else is in, in his words, and everything else eventually fades away. Right. And I mean, no, there's only one thing that stands the test of time, and that's God and God himself. That's true. But that's why we were created, wasn't it? Okay. fellowship with him. Yeah. Uh, we were created to fellowship with God and glorify God. Remember Adam and Eve in, in the garden? God would come. He had walked with them, fellowship with them. Uh, there was nothing but joy and happiness in them. That, that was all there was. Then what happened? Sin. Yeah. Sin and shortly after that, death. Joy and happiness weren't automatic anymore. Uh, matter of fact, it was just the opposite. Uh, misery, hardship death, all these things, that's what became automatic. Uh, just for that reason, the fellowship of God had been cut off. It was uh, it was not available anymore. And it created this misery and this unhappiness. And it's been that way ever since. And it always will be. <clears throat> so in closing, uh, and I know I've, I've ran through this so fast, I, I don't even know how much of this stuff I've missed, but uh, but in closing, the next time you come in contact with somebody or come across cross paths with somebody that's unhappy, has no joy, uh, just in a bad way, maybe the life's not going the way they want it to, all these kind of things, but they have no joy, what are you going to tell them? You're searching for your joy in the wrong places. Do what? You're searching for your joy in the wrong place. Exactly. You, you can almost tell it may, you have to kind of watch how you say it, it may come across as being hard and uncaring, but you can basically tell them, well, it's it's no wonder that you don't have any joy. It's it's going to be that way. It's That's the way it has to be. There is no way for you to have joy. If you don't know God and you don't know a son and you haven't surrendered to him and have a fellowship with him, you're not going to have joy. You may have better days. Some days will be better than others. Uh, doesn't mean you'll always be completely miserable. There'll be what you call good times and bad times, but you won't ever have true joy until you have that fellowship with God. That's that's what you were born for. That's what you were created for. And uh, without that, you'll, you'll never have true joy. 
and like I said, I ran through that kind of quick. I didn't think I'd get finished, but I got finished quicker than I thought of it. But y'all have any questions or comments? I do have one comment. Uh, as far as people, you know, trying to find joy, if you're looking for your joy, you're looking for eternal joy in something that's temporary, you're never going to find it. But like you said, if you put, you know, if you put your eyes and put your faith, and put, you know, your heart and give it to Christ, you're going to find that eternal joy. Right. right. It's, when, you, when you think about it, it, like I say, God made the universe in a certain way. And when he made it, it was naturally perfect. Man messed that up. But it's still, we were still created for the same reason. That sin is, is broken that, and sin has separated us from that. But God even provided a way to take care of that. Uh, so we're still, we're not without hope. Uh, if it wasn't for what God did for us, we'd be without hope. But but God made a way for us, so there is hope. But it's not automatic. If, if you, uh, you'll be born without hope. And until you surrender to God, uh, you won't have the hope, and, and you won't have the joy that he wants you to have. That's You were created to have that. Uh, that's what he intended all along. So that's good. Anybody else? There was a pastor back home. He used to say this every Sunday morning. He said, you know, a lot of people trust other people for this, that, and other. He said, no, don't put your trust in man, because man will always, always let you know. That's true. That's true. That's good advice. I feel like it's Times I equate joy with peace, being at peace with God, with where God has me. And the times that I wander out of that, to get away from where God would have me do, what He would have me doing, I, I feel more of the static of the world in a way, but more in the way of me hearing what God would have me doing. And I feel like that when that peace is gone and that joy is gone, it, that's when that feels like the mundaneness of the world. Of the world kind of down a sure, sure. I, I, I'm going to take up much more Brother Pete's time. Uh, but but the one thing that kind of crossed my mind in studying this, um, it's one of the things that, spiritual things that you really can't put your, put your arms around, really can't reach out and touch it and say exactly why it is or, or what. But uh, there are people and y'all know a lot of them. There are people that, that come to this church, some of the, uh, the men that have come here and preached, things like that. Uh, and I may not, if you put all the time that I've been around them together, I may not have been around them as much as people I work with and stuff. I'm, I'm with more time in a week than I've been with them in my whole life. But those people, have a, they don't have the same kind of place in my life or in my heart or whatever as these preachers and things I've come across. And you can even go back, Brother Pete's brought it up before, but Sherry and I got a chance to go with him on a, I guess you call it a missionary trip to go do some building uh, and believe. But we come across people that I, you know, I would never, I have no way to relate to them any kind of way, uh, the way they live, the way I live, where, where, you know, nothing about them is relatable to me other than the fact when we started singing and worshiping and having, you know, uh, hallelujah. True fellowship. Fellowship's a real thing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it was. Hallelujah. Real. And like I said, it's, I don't even know really how to, I know it's God, but other than that, I don't even know how to tell you to, how where it comes from, what it is, you know, other than God, but you know, yeah. but it's it's real. It's amazing that I can just be around these people for a, a relatively real short time, but they mean more to me than maybe some other people that I've known the biggest part of my life. It's uh, so anyway. We're one in Christ. But this is why this is this right here that we're in right now. This is why this is so important, and why God emphasizes so much in the New Testament uh, being together in fellowship with uh, with other believers is is where we where we get our strength. Where we I mean our strength comes from Him, but it's through others, you know, and the fellowship. Yeah, it's a real thing, and it's, it's special, and, and we should be like John. We should want other people to experience that. 
That should be one of the things that drives us. Uh, I just wanted to say something here before I forgot about it. Uh, 
I I made Steve talk about earlier. Did y'all hear anything about Brother Dale before yet? Yeah. Andrew spoke to me last night. Uh, Brother Dale got a bad uh, infection. Andrew's daddy, yes, John sir. Dale, and he's, uh, he's in, the in the hospital, not doing too good. Um, they're trying to get his fever down and everything. Yes. Takes, uh, blood pressure is real low, and they're considering putting a pacemaker in if they can't get his uh, it's infection. It's not, not COVID or something. It's COVID. No, it's it, it, it's a sepsis anterior infection. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, I mean, most likely he will come out of it after a while, but it's going to be real problematic long-term cause a lot of damage, so uh, just pray for him. All right, Tony, why don't you go ahead and offer prayer for Brother Dale. Heavenly Father, we do all come uh, together together, Lord, uh, to pray for all of our members who are dealing with, with the different problems and where everyone who, who has need of you, Father God. We do want to lift up Brother Dale specifically, Father. Uh, the human body is so complicated, Lord, and we don't really understand how it all works, Father. But we're so thankful that it's, it's your creation, Lord, and we do know that we do know what you were capable of, Father. Or, or, or I guess I should say we, we do know that you're that there's nothing you're not capable of. So we do pray for everyone that's involved with this, with the medical staff and with, with their whole family, Father. We, we just pray for your peace and for your knowledge and for your comfort on everyone who's involved, Lord God, and, and just to be with them. To help this process go smoothly, Father, and, and through it all, let everyone just see your glory and your love for us, Father, and just let everyone come out feeling closer to you, Lord God. Um, and I just want to continue with that same prayer for every one of our members uh, who, who might be dealing with, with sickness with all this, with this current COVID that's going on, Lord God, and every silent prayer request in our heart, Father, we just, we know how needful we are of you, Lord, and we're so very thankful that we can just come to you. Father, and even with the pain and the worries that we can't even enunciate, Lord, we just, we're so thankful for how you understand what is on our heart and what we need, Father. We're just so thankful for your love. And I pray that it continues, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. 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 About 87.
curse is found. For as far as the curse is found, He rules the world with truth and grace, and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love. And wonders of his love, and wonders, wonders of his love. Amen. Uh, 15, was it? I don't know. I have three picked out. Okay. Okay. You done practiced three of them, huh? 515. There's a man that is there in faith, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the in your Bibles to John, John's Gospel. looking chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16, and um, seeing how the Lord just shared the burdens on his heart for his people during these last hours that he was on this earth with them. He did. God was manifest in the flesh and dwelt among us. I love that, Brother Billy. Dwelt among us, John said, beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten 
kind of the Father full of grace and truth. Anytime you look at Jesus Christ, that's all you're going to see. The glory of God and grace and truth. Amen? You look at one another long enough, you'll find fault. You look at me, you won't have to look very long. You'll find a lot of fault. You look at Jesus Christ, glory. Hallelujah. I've never, never regretted following Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I may have failed him many a time, and I may grumble and complain and lose my contentment sometimes, and that's a shame. I've been so blessed of God, but I tell you, when my eyes are fixed on him, I'm never disappointed in him, not at all, not in any way. Glorious Savior. And, uh, well, he prepared them. For trials that were coming on the earth, he prepared them for glory such as the coming of the Holy Spirit, fellowship, and last week we began to talk about how he prepared them for responsibilities, and we're going to uh, continue with that thought today. John chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Let me pause there, personal note. Brother Billy and Sherry, y'all remember down in Bay Lees and, and meeting Brother Chester and Remember, he came here and preached, and this is the text he preached from. I've never forgotten his message on abiding in Christ. Verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except you abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, and I heard a preacher find that one time is even one step away. Without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Last week, we looked at our responsibility towards our Lord. I asked, what's the main word that stands out in these verses? And Kira was the first one to answer. She said the word abide. And that's exactly right. Abide, continue, stay where you are. Christians are not called upon to attain to something they don't have. We are to remain, abide in Christ. <clears throat> stay where you are close to him and the picture of course is it's not the vine over here and the branches here they're one the branches in the vine and he's really dealing with the nature of what true Christianity is um, a Christian is a branch in the vine they're drawing their life from Christ they have life in him and draw life from him a Christian is not someone who has decided something or done something. A Christian is someone who has become something. United to Christ. Life in Him. Okay? You've been placed in that living vine. Therefore, the church, made up of all the members, <clears throat> is a living organism. It has that common life flowing through it. And that touches Billy on, you know, like you said that fellowship was there with that little group in Bailey's 
our lifestyles and means and everything are completely different. Government's different. Everything's different. But there was a fellowship around Christ. And that's why they can mean more to you than your own family. That sounds harsh, doesn't it? I love all of my family. And I love my extended family. But my family, my family has a problem. A lot of them think that because they are American, and generally good people, that they're Christian. But they're not all Christian. <clears throat> and I have more fellowship with someone who's a Christian and a little group over there like that in a moment. there. Something I don't have with my family that's lost. As much as I love them and want to see them saved. And yes, there is joy when one comes to the Lord. Amen. There is a rejoicing. Amen. Hallelujah. If somebody gets saved, well, shout hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for showing mercy to somebody today and saving them. Yeah. Amen. I'm glad to be saved. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. I'm thankful. I'm happy when people get saved. But the true church, the Christian is someone in the vine, united to Christ. The church is a living organism, united to Christ. That fellowship is there. The essence of living the Christian life is to live in union with Christ. Abide in me, he says. It's not a matter of just imitating his example. And it's not just a pretty picture. He didn't say, I'm like a vine and you are like branches. This is reality. I am the vine, you are the branches. All right. Then last week we started talking about what John is telling us in these verses. And the first thing we covered last week was that his life is our life. I am the vine, ye are the branches. His life is our life. He promised in Elta, and I'll put my spirit within you. First Peter, we read that. Second Peter, ye are partakers of the divine nature. The very life of God in us. His life is our life. Paul talked about Christ living in him. We looked at 1 John 3, 9, why the Christian cannot continue in sin. Well, We do still have bodies of flesh. We sin sometimes, don't we? Maybe more than we want to. But we don't like it. It's not who we are. It doesn't define who we are. It's not the real us. If you still love sin, you're not in Christ. You're not even a Christian. Well, we covered that last week. And um, we closed with this thought last week. Because his life is our life, we cannot do anything without him. We cannot. Okay? Abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. Verse 5, I'm the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. But here's the truth. Without me, you can do nothing. Because his life is our life, life, we cannot do anything without Him. And I'm talking about absolutely nothing that has a touch of heaven about it. We can do a lot of things, but you look back on it and you think, boy, I did that. God it. You know, right? You hear what I'm saying? Touch of the divine wasn't on it, was it? And we looked over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 where Paul tells us that our sufficiency is of the Lord. He makes us able ministers of the Testament. We don't have it in ourselves to do that. So, truth number one, his life is our life. Truth number two, because his life is our life, we cannot do anything without him. Now, let's get to today's message. Truth number three, because his life is our life, we can do anything. 
Well, you just said we can't do anything without Him. That's right. We can't do anything without Him. But in Him, we can do anything. What? All things. You're getting ahead of me. <laughs> Y'all do that sometimes. Because his life is our life, we can do anything. <clears throat> with the life of Christ coming in, let me put it this way, with the life of Christ in us, we can actually do something right. Now, I can mess up. I'm one of those people. I can mess up a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You never messed up any of mine. That's right. Thank you, darling, baby, girl. Daddy never messed up any of her peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. That's because I made most of them out of Mayhaw jelly. Amen. For you folks out in TV land, Mayhaw jelly is the best. Mike's over there. I remember your mama one and asked me, what's a Mayhaw? Oh, Lord. Us Louisiana folks are blessed. Mississippi, what Mayhaw's Mississippi are. Mayhaw's <laughs> good, too, but it ain't Mayhaw, brother. I love you. All right, listen. We can actually do something right because of the life of Christ in us. <clears throat> we do some things that are the result of the life of Christ in us. Isn't that precious? <clears throat> Our works on earth, they're, they're not perfect because we're involved in them, but, but there's something real there. God moved you to do that. It's real and lasting. Think about the two men Jesus noticed came to pray. The one a publican. I think you, I'm not like this sinner over here. I do this, I do that. But think about that publican. Wouldn't even look up but smote upon his breast. God have mercy on me, a sinner. When the worst of sinners come to Jesus Christ, there is more love of Christ in that first prayer, more devotion to God, more righteousness than that unrepentant Pharisee will ever know. Because his life is ours, we can do a lot. We can do anything. Hallelujah. I like that. This is what true righteousness is when it's being wrought in our heart by the Spirit of Christ within us. Now, let's turn over to where my darling wife took us in advance over to Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I cannot do all things through Christ that do, does not strengthen me. I can't do wicked things, can I? I can do all things though through Christ that's in God's will is what I'm getting at. Listen. Now a lot of people, I know we live in the days of you know, where people make a religion of using God for self-help measures. And they quote this verse a lot, I can do all things through Christ. And what they try and do is get a bunch of money. But maybe we ought to go back and read verse 10 down to 13. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again wherein you were also careful but you lacked opportunity. They wanted to do something to help Paul but they, they couldn't get the help to him. Verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. A lot of people don't quote verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, when they're in some of the conditions Paul was in, because most of us ain't never met them. Being stoned, being shipwrecked, 
being put in prison, being whipped. Paul said, I can do all these things because Christ is there strengthening me. I'm abiding in Him, drawing life from Him. How about that, brothers and sisters? Government ain't put so much on us yet. We ain't been whipped and put in prison. Amen? You gonna stand for Christ's sin? People take you out and stone you and think they've done God a favor? We've got brothers and sisters in Christ being persecuted for real around the country right now. I mean around the world. Paul said, I'm not speaking in respect of want. I've got all I need because here's what Paul said. Whatever state I am in, I'm content. And the next verse defines that. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Paul said, if I've got a whole lot, if y'all have got you know, a, a good mission offering to me and I got a comfortable place to stay and I'm preaching the word every day. You know what? My thing is, I still say, Lord Jesus, I need you. Don't let me depend on these things. And if those things are taken away and I'm in a prison or I'm being beaten, thank you, Lord, let me draw upon your life. I have your fullness. I'm full because you, Jesus Christ, are the fullness of God. That helps us understand I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Okay? Let's go back to John 15 and verse 5. He that abideth in me and I am in him, the same bringeth forth what? See, because his life is our life, we can do all. Let's go to 2 Corinthians again. <coughs> Just want you to hear these verses repeated from last week. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers. You don't make yourself an able man. You can't do anything without the Lord. Amen. You don't have it in yourself to do whatever you want to do in the kingdom. But God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, He does that for us. He does that for His children. He'll make you an able minister of the New Testament. Listen to it, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. He's able to take and minister life through vessels of clay like we are. His life is our life. Because His life is our life, we cannot do anything without it. Because His life is our life, we can do anything. He makes us able ministers. Okay? Now, it brings me to my next point. It's talking here about abiding in him. But did you notice he never tells us how to do that? Now I know you ladies accuse us men of never reading directions. Y'all go buy something, we're supposed to put it together, and y'all say, we over there tinkering with it and getting a bit aggravated and ain't fitting just right. And you wives, you know what you say? About your smart Alex. Why don't you read the directions? <laughs> Go away. Leave me alone. Hey, he didn't tell us how. So let's talk about the means of experiencing his life by abiding. How do we abide? Nowhere does he tell us how. But he does tell us some things that are associated with abiding. Some things that are closely related to abiding. One of them is the Word of God. One of them is the Word of God. Verse 3. Now ye are clean through 
the word which I have spoken unto you. Verse 7, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you. Another thing is prayer. The rest of verse 7, my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. How about obedience? Drop down to verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now these are not how-tos, but these are things associated with an abiding life. Let me ask you, let me try to get it across with a question. Has it been your experience that when you get away from the Word of God that your spiritual life kind of dries up? Amen. Has it been your experience that if you let prayer go, the same thing happens? If you get slack about obedience, does the same thing happen? You lose the sense of that flow of the life of Christ in your life. And then you get on your knees, you start to confess your sin, you pray again, you get back in the Word. Don't you feel that life flowing again? Get close to God. Amen. These things are not how, but they are so closely associated with it. See what I'm saying? He gives us these things. He mentions this in, a, in connection with abiding. Now, <clears throat> There are some results from abiding. And one of them is answered prayer. Verse 7 again. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. You know, if you are abiding in Christ, you'll be desiring the right things and therefore asking the right things. Come on now, y'all. Help me out here today. Do y'all ever ask the wrong things for the wrong reasons? Nod your heads this way, every one of them. <laughs> yes, you do. But isn't it sweet when you've been close to Christ and your prayer is just for His glory? One of the results of abiding is asking and receiving. Another is you'll bring forth much fruit. Verse 5, the middle of it, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Those that are abiding in him and he in them bring forth much fruit. Drop down to verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Now you'll have Christ's likeness. I'm not going to take time to turn there today, but think of the fruit of the Spirit. Don't you think that flows from the life in Christ? The fruit of the Spirit is not something you have to work up and perform. It comes from the abiding life. It, it comes just as natural as fruit being born. Okay? The branch in the vine is going to bring forth fruit. You're abiding in Christ. The fruit of the Spirit is just going to be there. You don't have to work it up. In fact, you can't, amen? amen? You can pretend to have it, but you won't have it. Okay? <coughs> now, <coughs> he's talking about the overflow of the life of Christ in us. Why, why at times am I not Christ-like? It usually has something to do with this area of abiding. I'm not abiding like I should. Okay? We make it so difficult sometimes, but it's just a simple matter of drawing our life from Him. So, if we abide in Him, some of the benefits, answered prayer, much fruit. Another one is a deepening love relationship with Christ. Billy dealt with this in John's writings. Okay, drop down to verse 10. 
Because this is a troubling verse to some people. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. That word if throws a lot of people. If ye abide, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Let's read another troubling verse along with that. Turn back to John chapter 10, verse 17. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. That word because troubles people. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life. Does that mean that the Father would not love Christ if Christ did not lay down his life? If you keep my commandments, you abide in my love. Does that mean if, if I can't grind it out and keep every commandment, he ain't going to love me? Do I earn his love by keeping his commandments? Yeah. It's a totally voluntary thing on Christ to lay his life down. Likewise, here in chapter 15, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. <clears throat> I don't have to grind things out, and if I slip up, God quits loving me. I'll tell you, if he quit loving us, when we slipped up, wouldn't none of us be loved, would we? And love doesn't work that way. Hallelujah. I want to please Him. That's our heart's desire. But if I slip up, did I go further than the grace and love of God can reach? You see, the Lord is getting us here to he's helping us see that we can have this deepening love relationship with Christ Christ loves us first and that leads us to love him and as a result of our love for him we obey him gladly and as a result of that he keeps pouring that sense of his love in us keeps us going. Hallelujah. We love him more, and we obey him more, and we experience more of the flow of his love into our life. Now that's how that ever deepening relationship goes with Christ. But here's what happens, isn't it? You're going along just fine with a sense of the presence of God in your life. And you start to get slack. Let go of a little Bible reading here, a little prayer there, a little obedience here. You just get slack. What happens? Like David of old, your bones get dry, don't they? Things just aren't right. But the love is still there. And you come back to the Lord and it flows again. So he's letting us know that if we keep his commandments, we will abide, always be enjoying that love. We don't have to forfeit the flow of his love, the sense of it. Why do you think you lose the sense of it ever? It has something to do with the fighting, doesn't it? Yes. Some, some, something separated you. Without me, one step away, the preacher said, without me, you can do nothing. Well, let me close with one thing Billy touched on this morning. There's another benefit of abiding in him. You know what it is? Verse 11, chapter 15, verse 11. That fullness of joy. 
These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Abide in me. That's what he's been talking about. I, I've spoken all this to you. You know why? There's a joy. It's mine that I've given to you. Your joy can be full when you're abiding in me. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I could use a little fullness of joy now and then. Well, amen, Brother Pete. I could too, Brother. Amen. I could use a little fullness of joy now and then. Amen. I sure could. Hallelujah. Let me say it to you this way. In the Christian life, the half-hearted way is a way of misery. The whole-hearted way is a way of joy. If your whole heart's not towards Christ, you're going to be miserable. But if your whole heart is towards Christ, there's a joy the world knows nothing of, but you'll know it. You may not can explain it. You can. You're just like Blue Bell ice cream. <laughs> How are you going to explain it to somebody that ain't never tried it? you got to say, here, taste and see. So you say, taste and see. No wonder Peter said, taste and see that the Lord is good. I believe old Peter was abiding in Christ to be able to say, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, you're all out for God, your joy be full. We've been talking about our responsibility to the Lord and it's summed up in this, abide in Him. Remain where you are by virtue of your life in me. Stay close to me. Don't try to go out and attain something. I'm the vine. Just abide in me. Let's stand together. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to talk about our responsibility towards our brothers and sisters. Anybody here need to come to Jesus Christ today? You need to be saved today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You've come. Abide in Him, brothers and sisters, and have fullness of joy. Joy answered prayer. A sense of His love.